you know, I work in exclusively in nuclear energy and the uranium and light water reactor world, and it's reinvigorating personally and professionally to be here and, and hear from all these great ideas and, in a, and to imagine a, a different future. Uh, but I guess I wouldn't be a very good uh, lawyer or very good credit to my profession if I didn't uh, highlight some items that you all, if not already aware of, certainly should be or, or perhaps even wary of. Uh, and so I want to talk about a couple of regulatory issues, really three different regulatory issues facing um, involving thorium and in particular thorium regulation here in the United States. You may or may not be familiar with the background of regulation of nuclear energy here in the U.S., but in general it used to be the Atomic Energy Commission. And in 1974 that was split into two groups. One is the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which has broad authority under the Atomic Energy Act to regulate nuclear materials. It's really the civilian nuclear energy side. They regulate source material, which is defined as uranium and thorium in any chemical or physical form. Uh, some of that authority they can uh, devolve to certain states like California that have uh, you know, developed an appropriate regulatory program. Uh, the NRC licenses all uh, uh, construction and operation of all civilian nuclear reactors, so there's no agreement state uh, process for that. The NRC is the sole regulator for those. And the NRC also uh, licenses the import and export of thorium and thorium-containing products. On the other side, you've got the Department of Energy, which is really, you, you talk about being involved in the promotional aspects of nuclear energy um, for, of interest here. They're, they're working on the uh, critical materials strategy. They're doing a lot of research and development for advanced nuclear materials, advanced nuclear projects, things like that. I'm sure you all are, are very familiar with. So with that background, I wanted to touch first on a little bit of regulation of uranium and thorium and I guess rare earth facilities in particular. Um, the NRC doesn't regulate uh, uranium and thorium ore in the ground. It only regulates it, doesn't even regulate the ore after you've brought it from the ground. The NRC's regulatory jurisdiction begins uh, with the processing of ores and in that part, point that only ores that contain greater than 0.5% by weight of uranium and thorium. So if you're processing uh, uh, minerals for rare earths or looking for thorium or uranium, as, but you're below that threshold, you don't require an NRC license. So you can go ahead and do that. But if at any point during the processing of those materials, your concentrations exceed that 0.05% threshold, now your entire uh, entire process is going to be licensed by the NRC or by an agreement state. And so what this means is you're going to have a license to possess the material, you're going to have to have another license or another part of that license will allow you to use that material, that means to work with it, and then you're also going to have to dispose of your waste streams as low-level radioactive waste to the extent they contain any, you know, any uh, uh, remaining nuclear uh, radioactive materials. So. Uh, you know, that is a, a very important threshold to be uh, concerned with and to try and avoid to the extent you can if, uh, if that's something you're working with. I guess as I mentioned there are two exceptions. One is the, uh, as I said, for unrefined and unprocessed ore. Uh, but there's also an exception for thorium and thorium containing products. So I talked about the process stream goes over 0.05 percent. That triggers all of this extra regulatory oversight. But that doesn't apply at the final step if you're creating a product that has concentrations up to 0.25 percent by weight. And that product, by the way, can be, um, you know, oxides and, uh, you know, bulk concentrates. It doesn't have to be, you know, embedded in some final, final product for commercial sale to, to the public. So this is just, I think, a little bit of an oversight of uh, general background on how the NRC looks at uh, licensing of thorium-containing materials. So you would look and say, all right, well, the NRC, what's been their experience with uh, rare earth facilities? I think, you know, historically, if you look at, um, you know, the agencies dealing with legacy disposal problems, most of them or many of them are, uh, relate to ores that were processed primarily for their rare earth content, and you end up with waste piles that contain, you know, relatively high concentrations of uranium and thorium that present long-term hazards uh, that, that have to be dealt with. So I think what that's created within the NRC is a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, it's something that, it's a problem that they have to deal with, and so it's something they look back on as something that has been 
uh, was a failure for them in the past, I guess, and they've never really fully come to grips with how they, how they regulate these kinds of facilities and these kinds of materials. And so there's a real gap of knowledge there over the last, let's say, 20 years or so, where there's not a lot of people left at the agency who are very familiar with um, you know, rare earth mining and thorium uh, uh, chemistry in general. Um, you know, there is one rare earth facility in the United States here in California, the Molly Corp uh, uh, facility at Mountain Pass, and I guess they had been ramping up production in the last couple of years. I think that's changed. I even read something, I think, in the last couple of days that if it missed some payments, I think triggers a 30-day window or something like that. I'm not sure of the details, but so that's, that's unfortunate for them. The good news is there's a facility, the Rare Element Resources, uh, submitted their application for a new rare earth mine in Wyoming uh, earlier in May that the NRC is currently reviewing that for an acceptance review. And uh, you know, I think they hope to get an application for that here in the next uh, you know, year to 18 months. You know, with the NRC, it often takes a little bit longer than that, so I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that extend out. But um, you know, they are, they are, uh, there is some interest in that, and that's going forward, and I think they are, I know, are very excited about that. And uh, uh, so that's, that's sort of the status of that within the NRC. <laughs> Um, switching gears, because I'm going to cover three regulatory topics here. The second one is advanced reactors, which I, obviously there's a lot of interest here. Um, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, I think the long-term goal, as Don was just mentioning, is to, you know, commercialize these technologies, to make some money from this and, and uh, you know, deploy it widely. Um, so, you know, that's something that the NRC is... Uh, as he mentioned, they're there to support that effort, and so if you're willing to write them a big check, they will, they will certainly do what they can to, uh, to get that licensed. But, you know, obviously, the, all jokes aside, this is something that they are beginning to take a look at and are trying to understand how they might be prepared or be better prepared to review an advanced reactor application. Um, so there's been some uh, NRC, DOE joint initiatives to to create some guidance and some guidelines for advanced reactor applications with the goal of you know, supporting eventual commercialization. Uh, you know, this is a process that at least for you know, Gen 3 plus reactors, I, I think the Department of Energy and industry would say worked pretty well. The, there was this new start program that uh, we got a couple of designs certified, supported a couple of applications to test the regulatory process and to you know, reduce some of the regulatory uncertainty which really you know, has the potential to increase costs significantly. And so I, I'm hoping that we'll see something like that for advanced reactors and um, you know, I, I uh, you know, look forward to, to seeing that. Just to give some, some ideas, some data points on this regard, the, you know, the design certifications for you know, recent Gen 3 plus reactors have been in the 60 to 80 million dollar range to get your design certified by the NRC. And that's for designs that are, for the most part, following well-established regulations. So, you know, that just gives you a starting point for thinking about the, the challenges with commercializing a, you know, molten salt reactor or another type of advanced reactor. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine those being less for the first ones through. Um, that said, the, the NRC is expecting a, an application for a, a small modular reactor, a design certification application from New Scale. I think it, by the end of next year is the, the target date. And I mean, obviously not directly applicable to advanced reactors, but I think what it does sh is going to create within the NRC is some recognition that they need to be flexible in their regulatory programs. They're going to start to think about, all right, well, what is the purpose of this intent? What's the intent of this provision? What's the intent of this requirement? And do we need to require every plant to, to check that box, or can we say it's not applicable? And so I think by, you know, as the NRC begins to internalize some of this flexibility and a new way of looking at their regulations in order to accommodate you know, a new scales design, I think those same principles can you know, create some momentum for advanced reactors as well. So that's, that's something I'm hopeful of in the future. Um, but ultimately, the efficiency of the licensing process at the NRC really hinges on a couple of things. It's the, the level of engagement from applicants. You know, if you're committed, fully committed to a project, the NRC will find the budget to and get the resources to be available to review your application. Um, you're going to have to engage uh, the NRC very early in that process. And uh, the final and the most important part is you're going to have to commit, submit a complete and high quality application. And while that sounds you know, axiomatic, it's actually much harder to do, I think, in, in reality than, than many people anticipate. 
All right, the third part I was going to talk briefly about is uh, import export licensing requirements. So I'm really touching on all very three different very different areas of uh, of NRC regulation. Um, but just to, to, to give a high level overview of the differences. So the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they regulate the export and import of uh, reactors, facilities, equipment, material. So that's things like source material, so thorium, you know, reactors and major components, uh, fuel cycle related uh, components. Um, and so for those NRC issues, two types of licenses. General licenses, uh, anyone can just use them as long as you meet certain criteria. There's generally an exception for those related to small quantities of material. Um, most other items, particularly, uh, you know, components of reactor facilities and, and fuel cycle facilities, those are going to require a specific license and a specific approval from the NRC. Um, the other side is with the Department of Energy. They control exports of technology related to the production of special nuclear material. And so they've interpreted that to include uh, commercial nuclear reactors, at least commercial light water reactors, because they generate some plutonium as part of their, uh, as their operation. And so they say, okay, anything related to light water reactors, that's now a, uh, a sensitive technology that we're going to control. So that includes technology, software, any sort of know-how related to reactors and equipment uh, and components that involve the, the generation of uh, power or special nuclear material at a reactor. Um, and that's, uh, uh, those require either a general authorization from Department of Energy, and that's there's certain criteria that that, that apply for, or you need a specific authorization again. Um, you know, so, uh, uh, or you need a specific authorization again. I guess I'll just highlight that the Part 810 rules have changed a little bit, or they're in the process of changing. There was a, a new, the, the program is being significantly revised earlier this year. Uh, final implementation is due to be complete later in August. So if you're, uh, if you've got a export control compliance program, um, you know, I'm sure you are already uh, looking at the effect of those changes on your on your, uh, your practices and your business. The cautionary note from, from the lawyer is, uh, you know, Part 810 applies a little more broadly than you might think from just reading the, you know, the 10 CFR rules. It really is a very specialized area and there's a lot of room to get tripped up. You know, so given the sort of globalization of the nuclear industry and, and you know, the, the U.S. is really focusing on uh, increased enforcement of their export control laws, I think it's critical that um, civilian, civil nuclear companies, uh, including designers and vendors, need to be very aware of the requirements surrounding those and need to have in place uh, effective export control programs. Um, those programs are a are key mitigating factor. If you do uh, mess up, the existence of the program can really help, uh, you know, reduce the, uh, uh, the impact of a, uh, of a violation. Uh, but the, anyway, the three things I think to, to most be concerned about is Americanized technology. So if you take a foreign technology and it comes out somewhere in the United States, customizes it for use in the United States, uh, brings it up to U.S. codes and standards, makes some design changes related to that, that technology is now considered to be an Americanized technology. And if you share information related to that with a foreign person, you are supposed to have a... Uh, an authorization, a license from the Department of Energy. Um, this, another one is if you are, even if you're located in the United States, but you're providing information uh, to a foreign person, you are, they call that a deemed export. So that is also a violation if it's a material that requires a license, but you're talking to a foreign person and sharing that information. Even if you're here in the United States, that's considered an export of your technology and can be, uh, uh, can be a violation of export control requirements. Um, and then, you know, lastly, if, even if you are authorized to, you know, transmit information to a foreign person, um, and then that, you need to have controls on the re-export of that information. So if you provide it to someone else, they need to be restrained so that they don't go and provide it to another uh, foreign person without your knowledge. So those are sort of a couple of different areas uh, you need to be uh, thinking about as you are, um, in your program, or just to be aware of some of these restrictions. You know, fortunately, there's an exception. Um, 
in the export control rules for conferences and public exchanges that are open to the public, so we don't have to worry about that here, obviously. But uh, you know, I think it is something that you know, for all of you that are working on these types of issues, you should at least be generally aware of. And as you get further into the details of your design and and are um, you know, looking at uh, to commercializing your technology and gaining insights from other people. I think these are things to certainly be aware of. And uh, that was that was really it. So, uh, thank you. Lindsay, is there any special relationship between the U.S. and Canada, or are they deemed to be another goddamn foreigner? They. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the question was, is there any special relationship between the, the U.S. and Canada? Are they considered to be another goddamn foreigner? I think I, I, think I got that right. Um, and the answer is there are certain countries that, are, uh, that don't require specific authorization for certain trans, uh, transfers of information. Canada, of course, is one of those countries that has a special relationship with the United States. So certain, you know, there's a category of technologies that can be transferred to those countries without special requirements. Uh, but then there also are other particularly sensitive technologies that cannot be without a specific authorization. But in general, uh, Canada is one of those, uh, uh, your atom countries or others, and uh, you know others that we have, um, you know, treaty relations with, um, uh, and, and we have agreed to have effective controls on non-proliferation regimes. We do allow those uh, exchanges to take place more freely. Jim. So, like, I know a lot of people in this room are anxious to get the answer to this one. Uh, so, is China on that exemption list? <laughs> China is not on that exemption list. So when the DOE decides to right. transfer technology to China, do they have to right. check their own box or what? Because well, so there is a, so there's a couple of I think there's a couple. Of, I'm not not entirely. Uh, this is not legal advice to everyone to rely on. I'll preface it with that. Um, but there's two two kinds of ways. Uh, one of which is we as a government have, they're called Section 123 agreements, so they're agreements under a provision of the Atomic Energy Act that allows for civilian nuclear cooperation. And we actually are in the process of renewing our 123 agreement with China, as I understand it. Um, and that allows for certain exchanges of information. So that's a different process, and so DOE would probably be under that, whereas commercial technologies would have to go through the DOE process. I just want to point out the reactor was designed for the U.S. military, right? Right. Kevin? Uh, so you noted that the source material can, is, is sometimes regulated by the agreement states instead of the NRC. Yep. Uh, so my question is, are those agreement states either unwilling or just de facto unable to, say, raise the limit on the concentration of thorium uh, for rare earth mining? given the level of concern surrounding the issue? Sure. Uh, that's a good question. Can the, uh, there's agreement states that can have regulatory authority over source material, and would are they be allowed to uh, raise the limits on the, the concentrations at which you begin regulations of uh, source material or of thorium-containing materials? I think the answer is it depends, but probably not. Because the way it works is the NRC has to decide that an agreement state program is quote, compatible with the NRC's regulatory program. And so they will look, you know, provision by provision, and they generally expect agreement states to have the same standards, the same minimum standards as the NRC. States are usually allowed to have more restrictive requirements, but rarely allowed to have more lenient requirements. So I imagine that the NRC would find that to be uh, an area of concern for them. So I would not imagine they would be in favor of that except unless there was particular circumstances that they could carve out uh, to ensure that it was being done safely. Uh, yeah, Tyson, you mentioned the NRC, you got to submit a high quality application. Yeah. What does that mean? Is it a choice of font or? Uh, so the question was, what does it mean to have a complete and high quality application? Well, that's, that's what you hire me <laughs> to help with. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but, but the real answer is the real answer is I mean it's hard it's harder in a, a case where you're talking about a new technology where you don't you're not following a very clear path but you don't say if you meet this requirement one two three four you're going to be okay so it's obviously harder to do for a you know advanced reactor design but where that comes in is you have all the pre-application meetings and the very good or upfront and early communication with your regulators where you try and reach agreement 
on you know, what are the standards you're expecting to see, what level of detail are you expecting to see in the application. You, know, you, you can work with the NRC, they will come and do pre-application audits at your site and look and say, all right, is this, is this kind of what we were expecting to see? And if it is, then you know, you're moving in the right direction. If it's not, the plan is to course correct before you submit the application. Thank you very much, Tyson. Okay. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks.